Hello team, welcome to another lecture for Kinesiology 2314, Sport Management. So this lecture covers management principles applied to sport management. And this is a great place to start to learn more about sport management because a great deal of the foundational aspects of sport management were drawn or borrowed from business and the synonym for business is management. So this chapter has some great information for us to learn and to uh, digest as we d begin to delve into what is sport management. So in terms of the history and definition, um, managers in any context, whether it's sport, business, uh, or other any other sort of uh, area and field, um, they're charged with maximizing their resources that are allocated to them. And it's their job to work as efficiently and cost effectively as possible. So a manager might have several types of resources at his or her disposal. It could be uh, financial resources like money or physical resources like real estate or uh, certain supplies that are the inputs into their product or um, there could be human resources, human capital, human resources, the people that uh, run uh, whatever processes are used to make the product. So it's the manager's job to maximize the efficiency of these resources. So in terms of the history of management, um, two phases evolved uh, in management, scientific management and human relations movement. And today, um, this field of management uh, from the organizational standpoint, known as organizational behavior, really is talking about examining and applying the human side of management to maximize the ability of your organization uh, in terms of, of its resources. So initially, um, the art or uh, trying to maximize the potential of employees was viewed as a scientific uh, endeavor. And uh, Taylor viewed this process of, of trying to hone the efficiency of workers uh, as the science of trying to find that one best way of doing a job. And Taylor believed that that one best way could would be uh, uh, or that workers would be enticed to work that one best way uh, through different rewards, whether it's economic or related. So more money or uh, t more time off, a bonus, uh, et cetera. So uh, people on the assembly line would be encouraged to work in that manner, uh, that one best way, regardless of how painstaking or difficult that was, but it was done to maximize efficiency uh, within that industry, and then people would be rewarded for that. However, um, there was a movement away from the belief that um, efficiency was a science and that it could that there was only one best way for managers to um, teach their workers to uh, uh, to engage in whatever job they were doing. Instead, um, this human relations movement believed that actually um, social factors in the workplace were what was important and that output depended on a feeling of worth and uh, happiness and sort of um, a... a, 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 a um, a belief that um, you were you were um, complete in the workplace, that um, uh, that it was that you you gained satisfaction. So it wasn't that the there that um, monetary rewards were driving the uh, the desires of workers to succeed in the workplace, but instead the focus was on satisfaction from a um, a belief sort of way, a social construction. And so um, there was a movement in, in Follett believed that 
effective management uh, was to motivate both uh, their employees to work for them and work in cooperation with them. So today we see the study of organizational behavior in the workplace as a combination of both the scientific side and the human side of workers within the workplace. And the point of organizational behavior, again, is still to maximize your resources um, so that the organization can gain a competitive advantage uh, in the workplace in whatever industry that it exists. And businesses have to deal with a, uh, a constantly changing environment, uh, whether it's dealing with the ebb and flow of, of the economy or knowing that there were, there's global competition within the workplace or that there's constant innovations within the workplace or constant innovations within your industry and that there is um, not only changes within the industry, but also within your workforce, that that there is diversification of employees. So the textbook introduces the concept of the planning, organizing, leading, and evaluation management process that is done in order uh, that's done by successful organizations. Each of these functional areas um, is used. To help, um, to help with the uh, completion of whatever responsibilities exist within an organization. So this planning, organ organizing, leading, and evaluating process is what organizational behavior uses as the backbone uh, to help a, a business or an organization uh, thrive within whatever industry it's a part of. So to start, with, in terms of the uh, business theory, the planning stage is defined as the process of creating and determining the goals that are desired by the organization and how are those goals going to be completed. So as part of the planning stage, um, leadership within the organization sets their course of action for how that organization is going to actually um, complete its goals. So there, through this process, the organization tries to put into motion what it believes um, are the, in the best interest of that organization. So um, for example, um, the organization Under Armour um, meets to set objectives in planning and then they will go ahead and actually uh, organize themselves, implement their plan, and then evaluate that and see if they actually uh, met their objectives. Now, the organizational process is something that is going to evolve. It's not sta it's not static. It's dynamic. Things are not set in stone. So um, managers must actually set both short term and long term uh, goals through the planning process. So again, going back to Under Armour, um, they might have a short term goal of hitting a specific sales revenue number for their uh, products, but then there's also long-term planning in terms of developing um, different product lines, uh, smart tech lines like you see in that picture uh, to, uh, to marry both uh, um, clothing and functionality, uh, and that would be something that is not going to happen from an R&D perspective until some point in the future. Now, once the organization actually Meet, uh, sets its planning criteria. Next would be organizing how to uh, execute a plan to meet your goals. And so this is where plans are actually going into action. And the manager actually um, <laughs> man manager act works to determine what jobs are needed and who is going to perform those jobs. So there's three specific elements the textbook talks about, which is developing an organizational chart, 
creating uh, position descriptions for what jobs or what uh, what um, what jobs will fill that organizational chart, what positions, and then develop the qualifications for whoever is going to fill that position. So this is a very, very important uh, part of, of the planning, organi organizing, uh, executing, and uh, evaluating stage because here you need to make sure that the organization is creating the, the proper position for the function that's necessary and also hiring that person that's qualified and that's going to help with uh, helping with uh, helping those goals succeed. And s proper staffing must be supported by training and professional development of the people that you hire. So for example here, we've get, got an athletic department organizational chart. So within the organizational chart for each position, there needs to be certain descriptions of not only the job functions of that position, but what authority that that, in, that individual has, who reports to that individual, and who, who that person themselves reports to. And I can tell you from personal experience that having an organizational chart that has clearly defined um, uh, the parameters for the authority that's given to that individual, who that person must report to and must defer to, and then who reports to that person. Um, because if the if it's unclear, then there creates a, a potential likelihood that multiple people will believe that they have the same responsibilities or similar responsibilities, or that they have authority that they do not actually have. And this ambiguity can create issues that would arise and potentially injure um, that person's effectiveness and the ability of the organization to actually complete their uh, uh, complete their objectives. Um, leading is the is the next part. So this is where the rubber hits the road, and now the sport manager is actually um, helping with um, assigning responsibility and accountability to the different employees that are that work within the organizational hierarchy and the manager is also responsible for dealing with any issues or conflicts that come up along the way so communication issues or any sort of interpersonal dynamics so this is a very important uh, stage of of this uh, flowchart because um, this is where potential issues or conflicts that might arise could derail the success of the organization uh, finally, evaluating. So once the um, once the uh, um, execution, the, the leading stage has has, has concluded, um, the manager is going to sit back and collect data and measure and evaluate the um, uh, the effectiveness of the organization towards meeting those objectives. So objectives also need to contain a component that can be adequately and objectively measured, uh, usually a time component, an amount com component, and a date component. So it can't just be um, in terms of an organization uh, wanting to set an objective saying we want, to, we want to improve our customer service, it might say we want to uh, increase our, um, the positive feedback from customers who use our service and take the poll from 85% satisfaction to 95% satisfaction within the next 12 uh, months or within the next fiscal year. So that way you can actually see objectively whether or not that percentage increased to the targeted point within that time period. So also different systems of monitoring and evaluation standards and might be designed and then rewards might be delegated for uh, to employees. Um, so key skills of managers. What does a manager n uh, need to have in order to be successful in sport management? Well, because sport management is a people industry, um, interpersonal skills uh, and people skills are very important. Be able to uh, interact with clientele and be able to hold a conversation. Of course, baseline uh, uh, baseline. Um, 
abilities to treat people fair and ethically and show respect, have emotional intelligence, things like that. Uh, kind of street smart skills are all required. Now in terms of communication, that's also part of inner, uh, your interpersonal skills and part of your people skills. So communication is, is more than just about knowing uh, what to say, but also how to say that. So um, the vast majority of our communication is nonverbal. It's body language. It's our gestures. It's our posture. Um, it's where, it, where are we making eye contact? It's, it's so it. I mean, although tone in what we say is important, but well, I would say that uh, tone is even part of how we say it or what we do. So because we might be unconsciously communicating a message that differs from our words, we must make sure that that's on the same, that both types of verbal and nonverbal communication are uh, consistent. Uh, also, of course, um, being uh, courteous uh, in professional is also important, and ethics is important, uh, because uh, sport managers often are asked to uh, give public speeches, and that sport managers also might also need to uh, oftentimes write in different uh, styles. And the textbook references different suggestions for dealing with communication, so I would recommend taking a look at that. Um, we also, uh, communication happens within the workplace in different ways, formally, informally, or unofficially. So a formal communication might be a written memorandum that has the organization's uh, um, he uh, uh, header on it, uh, or informal might be just a short email or passing in the, in the hall. And unofficial might be some sort of communication that someone uh, is not really authorized to give, but they're doing it in, in, in a different way. So there's different ways to communicate through channels, and uh, we, there's a whole lot more about communication and effective communication. And since sport uh, management is just like most any other industry involving management, communication is very important. Uh, diversity and managing diversity is also an increasingly important aspect of sport management because, um, again, sport managers deal with people from all walks of life. Uh, so uh, different people might differ in age, their race, their sexual orientation. Uh, they might have a disability. Uh, they, might, uh, they might come from a, a different country. But uh, these, uh, because sport is uh, a language that speaks to everyone, uh, oftentimes it brings very diverse people together. Um, there's also a, um, a trend within sport management to bring underrepresented uh, uh, individuals uh, from different walks of life into positions of power and management within the sport industry. Um, the Major League Baseball, the uh, uh, National Football League, and other leagues within the Big Four don't traditionally have the greatest track record for inclusivity, but there is now a concerted effort to bring more uh, people um, of a greater diverse background into that fold. And so that might also work with uh, the employment process. So sport managers must uh, be aware of that diversity is important within that these organizations value diversity and knowing how to, um, um, how to interact in a respectful manner with people who might be a little bit different than you is also important. Another uh, key skill is trying to uh, manage uh, technology. So in addition to things like uh, email that are now ubiquitous and um, online ticketing systems and, and, and uh, sales systems, uh, we also see technology uh, that's heavily uh, influencing sport managers in the form of social media. And social media is really a, a double-edged sword. It can be used for both uh, good and for evil. Uh, we see... Uh, creative uses of social media like Snapchat or Facebook or Twitter um, or uh, Instagram, YouTube um, that help to drive uh, new uh, new customers and, and new potential fans uh, to that organization. But uh, because uh, it's such an egalitarian type of uh, media, social media can also be used to 
um, to um, create uh, potential, I guess, controversies or scandals like we had with, uh, I believe his name was uh, Larry Tunsil, who was um, an offensive lineman from Ole Miss, uh, who right before the NFL draft went live, the pictures surfaced on social media showing him uh, in, um, partaking in illegal uh, drugs and uh, also um, other things and that led to him um, losing face, both both him and the Dolphins lost face. And this is just one example um, uh, of many different examples that exist involving social media. Um, the decision-making process and understand how understanding how to make decision is another key aspect of the managerial process. So um, we make thousands of decisions every week. Um, the textbook uses the, the, the example of why are you wearing what you're wearing today? Was it because it was clean, it matched, it was just something that was convenient? Um, did, did you have an important meeting? So we make decisions uh, fairly often of different levels of importance. And the um, one of the cl one classic model of decision making uh, suggests that we go through this process. You define the problem. What's the issue at hand? You set objectives. Was the long term objective? Is the short term objective? Uh, what's sort of the element to uh, hold that per yourself accountable to meeting that objective? Generating alternatives, uh, and you could do that by either bringing in. Uh, outside opinions or doing it on your own. So is it egalitarian or is it just you yourself? Selecting the most feasible alternative, meaning that it might not be the alternative that you like the most, but it's the one that's the most uh, feasible that can be done. Implement the decision and then try to control the results. Um, as I said before, um, it, it could be more participated decision-making by including people from the organization to make it more egalitarian, or you could just do it by yourself. Um, the text suggests that group decision-making should be used when and that more ideas need to be generated. There's a great amount of information to be shared. Alternative perspectives are needed. Fairness is highly valued. So um, if it's a, a decision that affects uh, a great deal of people, it might be fair to um, bring them into that decision-making process. And just going another key skill, similar to, to diversity managing change, um, oftentimes employees uh, resist change. So as a manager, it will be your job to try to work with uh, managing uh, people's expectations and getting in, hopefully, uh, making their resistance to change uh, less steadfast. And managers should try to set priorities for what wants to, what is to be changed, deliver viable results, and try to work uh, with different stakeholders to make sure that they are all fully committed to that change. Uh, motivation is also important as we get towards the end here. Um, setting goals and objectives helps with motivation. Uh, there's many theories out there involving uh, Hertzberg's two-factor ideas, so is it something that are people motivated by money or are they motivated by prestige and things uh, related to their ego? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, is it, you know, where within the hierarchy of needs is someone currently, do they need, um, is it, is it uh, are they motivated just to survive or are they motivated to by prestige? Um, so these are some sort of examples of helping with motivation. So, in summary, sport managers really do face uh, rapidly changing environments um, with as technology, the, the, the pace of technology and its changing continue to accelerate uh, as the world becomes a more increasingly connected uh, and expanded uh, uh, space from the realm of sport management. Uh, sport managers need to be able to be skilled at the planning, organizing, leading, and evaluation process. And again, we want to take it back to sport managers uh, are charged with managing a variety of resources within the organization, but one of the most pivotal is human resources, the person. And by uh, using diff these different theories that we talked about uh, and understanding how to motivate your people and get the best out of your people, um, that's really how an organization is going to gain a competitive advantage in the workplace and be successful. So with that, um, 
that's we've come to the end of the chapter. Um, please uh, feel free to uh, send me an email or call me or stop by my office if you've got any questions. And then uh, we, I'll rejoin you uh, for the next lecture um, shortly uh, in, in a bit. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.